In this video, I'm going to talk a little bit about land use and environmental issues, as well as the new International Division of Labor and how that's affecting Southeast Asia. So if we think about the climate and physical geography in Southeast Asia, we know that a lot of it has a, a tropical rainforest type climate and a lot of rainfall from the monsoon. So with that, uh, one of the major agricultural crops is rice. So you see rice terraces and paddies uh, throughout the region uh, is making up the landscape. Uh, an example here that you see is a terraced landscape. Um, you have also shifting uh, cultivation, slash and burn, or Swindon agriculture in the rainforest type areas, and a lot of and a lot of land also being used for plantations, uh, for growing things like rubber and palm oil, and then smaller areas for house gardens for subsistence. With this uh, increase of plantation style agriculture and also the extraction of timber, there are a lot of environmental issues that we find throughout Southeast Asia, particularly deforestation in places like peninsular Malaysia um, and in Indonesia. Um, there's also serious water pollution from cities, erosions, and ship traffic um, in places like Indonesia, and this has been especially uh, detrimental for folks who are um, using the ocean for a lot of uh, fish as a resource. So looking at the some of the causes and consequences of deforestation, again, one of those main causes is the clearing of land for agriculture, both for plantation-style export agriculture and subsistence, and the production of tropical hardwoods, paper, and pulp. We see with that an endangering of major animal species because of a lack uh, or loss of habitat, um, flooding as these areas get a lot of rainfall and without the forest there to help hold the soil in place you're able to have um, much more runoff and soil erosion and flooding as a result. If we look at how deforestation is distributed across the region we can see that Indonesia is by far the leader with over a hundred thousand uh, hectares um, having been deforested, um, Myanmar as well as also having um, major deforestation there. Here's an example of some of the types of landscapes left after the deforestation process. In areas that have been cleared for um, new housing developments. It's important to not only think about these places as sources for um, tropical timber, but also to think about where the flows of these goods go. And we see that a lot of these exports um, travel to places within um, Eastern and Southern Asia. So you can see a majority of exports coming from uh, Indonesia going to uh, places like Japan um, and China as well. We mentioned earlier one of the aspects of Southeast Asia as being a sort of crossroads for a lot of different cultures. So around 60,000 years ago, migrants came from uh, the continent of Asia, crossed a land bridge that existed at the time, and peopled uh, this area. At the time, there was then two types of cities that emerged, port cities for trade and religious and ceremonial centers. And you still see kind of um, a focus on dual cities within many of the countries in Southeast Asia, either because of this tradition or things like um, conflict. Uh, so for example, in Vietnam, uh, Vietnam having been split between North and South Vietnam for a time, you have uh, two major um, sort of cities there as well. So in a lot of places you have these dual city systems. Maritime trade uh, was a major influence beginning about 2,000 years ago and so you had merchants from the Middle East, China, and India all traveling through this area for trade and so you have a tremendous amount of religious and cultural diversity where Hinduism, Buddhism, and Islam 
are all present in terms of religions, in terms of government, society, and architecture. And you see that sort of combination in some of the aspects of Southeast Asian culture. Some of these images below show um, one of the major uh, sort of religious ceremonial centers in Krawat in Cambodia. With European colonialism, you saw an integration of this area into uh, the world's economic system and kind of a dual economy that emerged. Um, European uh, colonizers were interested in trying to set up large-scale corporate agriculture on plantations for export. And so you had um, that sort of as a reorientating of um, local systems of production. But then you also had traditional peasant cropping that existed and a portion of land was uh, left for that, but it was a very diminished portion of land which often led to food, sh food shortages. You also uh, see the development of a real differentiation between the urban centers and the port cities that um, had a lot of contact with European colonialization and the world economy and indigenous and rural hinterlands. So you have um, a sort of a dualism within the countries themselves. Some of the major players within this um, and during of course this period of industrialization and the industrial revolution in Europe um, were Britain. You see the British East India Company expanding um, and especially interested in growing rubber in plantations or tin and hardwoods. In Indochina or peninsular Southeast Asia, you have the French having holdings in Cambodia, Laos, and Vietnam. Later, um, the United States becomes interested in this area um, after the Spanish-American War has uh, the Philippines as a colony. Uh, and Thailand was an area that remained independent here. And of course, the U.S. also became involved later in the 1960s as the French left Vietnam and there was a conflict between uh, the Communist North and Southern Vietnam and the U.S. entered into that conflict there as well. If we look at the culture within this region, there is a lot of diversity, 500 different ethnic and language groups. Um, many are uh, related to the lingua franca of Malay or Malaysian. Um, there's many coherent nations in terms of culture, so a sort of overlap between the idea of a nation and a state. So, for example, uh, the people in Thailand being majority identifying with being Thai, Vietnam, Vietnamese, etc. But if we break down ethnicity a little bit farther, we can see that in terms of religion, we have um, Buddhism as being the dominant religion on peninsular Southeast Asia. In the island section, particularly Indonesia, Islam is the majority religion. Um, Indonesia is actually the most mo most populous Islamic country in the world. Um, you also have Hinduism in Burma, Java, and Bali, and Christianity in the Philippines from that legacy of um, Spanish colonialism and Catholicism. There's also a lot of um, sort of integration between traditional local beliefs and these uh, larger um, sort of world religions. Southeast Asia is really interesting too in terms of women's roles. So women in Southeast Asian families tend to have um, more power within the family itself, um, so somewhat less patriarchal in terms of the power structure within the family. Um, and then there's been a lot of new employment opportunities for women with the new industrial uh, division of labor, but still women often earn less. So the area is about 50% urbanized with many large cities that have over 10 million people. So places like Bangkok in Thailand, um, Manila in the Philippines, and Jakarta in Indonesia. Again, you see those dual centers in places like Burma with uh, Mandalay and Rangoon, and in Vietnam with Hanoi and Ho Chi Minh City. If we look at economic development, after um, independence from colonial rule, a lot of these companies engaged in import substitution to try to encourage domestic industry and set up tariffs um, to protect their industry from 
um, uh, competition from other parts of the world. There's been a shift to export oriented uh, production and the search to try to find competitive, uh, comparative advantage, things that these parts of the world can produce uh, more efficiently than others. Similar to East Asia, you have a lot of state involvement in economies and then also foreign direct investment coming in and much of that from um, other players within Asia. There's been a move to towards uh, resource extraction and an increase in consumer goods. You see a lot of uh, this new development happening in those free trade zones, somewhat similar to the special economic zones that you saw in China, where companies are given a place to come in, set up shop, and not have to pay the same sort of trade uh, taxes and tariffs that they would in other parts of the country and be supplied uh, with cheap labor there. So if we look at exports, we can see that a lot of the exports in Southeast Asia are based around clothing and textiles. So for example, more than 70%, 75% of the total exports for Burma, Cambodia, and Laos are clothing and textiles. And you see a lot of those um, going into the um, Asian region, uh, so to places like Japan, um, a lot to the European Union, and a lot to the United States as well. If we look at economic development indicators such as GDP in Southeast Asia, we can see that some countries such as uh, Singapore, um, Brunei, and Malaysia having fairly high GDP, Singapore of over $30,000 a year. Other countries have um, much are much poorer in terms of GDP per capita, Vietnam, Burma, Laos, Cambodia, Indonesia, and the Philippines as being particularly poor with under $5,000 um, worth of GDP per capita. With that unevenness of development, it's easy to see why migration might be a major factor within Southeast Asia. So like in other parts of the world, we see source countries where migrants are coming from as having high unemployment. Um, workers want to go work in other countries so they can send remittances or money back uh, to their homes and their families. Um, this also helps reduce political pressures at home. You know, there is always that pressure for the government to um, help people that are struggling to try to find a job, things like that. So it's a major factor in Indonesia, Thailand, and the Philippines, and we'll look at that here in a second. Receiving countries are places that have uh, labor shortages, need workers to build infrastructure and for domestic services, and migrants are really, you know, very cheap labor labor often and come into countries uh, with few rights and are easy to exploit. So you see this within places like Singapore and Malaysia. So this looks at migration just within Indonesia. The most populous part of Indonesia is the island where uh, Jakarta is located. And you can see that as having a lot of these red circles here showing it as a place of origin for a lot of migrants. Again, you know, the political establishment within Indo in Indonesia, if they're unable to find work and employment for people living on its most populous island, they are encouraging folks to move out to other parts of Indonesia where there's uh, less people to try to um, sort of mitigate their uh, desire for um, employment when the country isn't able to provide it. The link to the Blue Elephant video shows you some examples of migrants, not just from within Southeast Asia, but from other parts of the world coming into Malaysia to work in uh, transnational corporations, um, factories. Transnational corporations in Southeast Asia have had a big impact. A lot of them are names of brands that we know, uh, such as Nike, where over 800,000 workers work for contractors. Um, over 80% of these are young women that are working for the in the formal economy for the first time and are well known for things like poor working conditions, excessive overtime, and low wages. Uh, one of the things that folks have done to try to uh, combat um, these concerns about worker exploitation is to try to connect uh, consumers in the developed world with uh, folks that are working in the developing countries. So you see this ad that kind of plays with uh, the symbolism that Nike often uses to advertise um, and looks at the idea of um, 
how those commodities are actually created. So if you take a second and read this, um, you'll see how they're trying to use that.